All right, how about a little quick trivia for Bitcoins? In the movie Sneakers, what is the name of the character that Dan Aykroyd plays? Nope. Who said it? All right, Bitcoins. Blink. Let's see, let me find another one. Okay, all right. In the movie Back to the Future, what was the name of the school principal who was played during both uh, Marty and his parents' school days? Anyone? The principal's name, Back to the Future. Come on. I this was a, okay, who said Strickland first? Somebody. You, oh, you guys don't count. You guys, you guys, I'm just kidding. All right, well, you're going to have to come find John for a Bitcoin then. I know John. That's my guy. Let me try. <laughs> All right, I'm going to introduce our next speakers. Our next talk is called Movement After Initial Compromise. We have two speakers. Matt is a red team security engineer conducting red team operations and penetration tests for 6th gen. He has seven years of experience in the information security field and operated on a, an NSA certified DOD red team. Uh, he's also a U.S. Marine Corps veteran that specialized in signal intelligence. Thank you to our veterans. And also Colin Hartley. Colin is a persistent cyber operator for NSA certified DOD red team. Enough said. Thanks, guys. All right. Uh, like you said, our talks on uh, movement after initial compromise. Uh, Hartley and I met. He was a, well, he's still, he's still active duty. He can't say where he's currently working right now. But I was a contractor there. And, uh, we, we hit it off, and um, I learned a lot from him. He's, I hope he's learned some from me. And uh, we've worked together for a while now. Uh, I left him to work at 6th Gen, but um, I'm saying that's us because we're both newbies and uh, we're babies. It's our first time presenting. And uh, we've gone to a few conferences, and a lot of people spoke about a lot of things we're talking about. And then uh, they didn't have video examples, and they didn't go into some of the detail that I wanted. So we, we only have 45 minutes. We can't deep dive super deep into all of them, but I hope that people learn a lot and take a lot from the information. All right. So my name is Matt Batten. Uh, I go by Sleep Zero, which uh, there's two meanings. So in Cobalt Strike, that means interactive mode. If you might use this Cobalt Strike, which is a C2, right? Command control. And uh, it also means I don't sleep a lot. And then uh, I have a GitHub. Uh, I've created some Python scripts for a uh, logging of Cobalt Strike as well. It'll take it all and then I'll put it in CSV. And uh, you can import it in whatever you want. And it's super useful. You can um, edit it to you do whatever you want, utilize it however you want. Uh, so I currently work at Sixgen. It's the best company and job I've ever had. My team's amazing, all brilliant minds. And uh, they really look out for me. And I'm just super happy. I get to work from home, too, which is really nice. It's a big plus. Uh, so my husband, I was recently married in May. And um, red teamer, pen tester, develop, and like you said, Marine Corvette, and um, also cat dad. And so there's my wife hugging R2D2. Thought it was funny. Um, us married. I don't know if she knew I was putting this picture in there, but it made me really happy. And pissed her off. She's up. She's up there, so it's funny. And then um, there's my cat. Who always looks pissed off when I drink coffee. I love dogs too, but <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's probably good work. All right. So. Uh, my name is Colin Hartley. Um, as you can tell by the spell spelling of Colin, um, I normally just go by Hartley because of the military and because it's hard to understand. Um, I'm an NSA certified red teamer and active duty military. I promise I'm not spying on you or <laughs> in your computers. <laughs> I promise that. Um, I'm not married, but I'm older brother. I take pride in my little sisters. Uh, red teamer and penetration tester. He's the cat man. I'm the dog man. And uh, moving forward. Got you. All right, so what, what we're going to cover is um, initial recon once on a compromised system. So once you get that initial callback, uh, what you're going to do immediately after, uh, we're going to talk about lateral movement, so how to move to other systems once you're on that network. Um, port forwarding, so how to send data through a system that you've already compromised to 
make it look like it comes from the compromised system to the target. So they don't see your attack machine, right? Your attack platform. You want to hide yourself. Um, how do you utilize tradecraft and not get caught while moving? So a lot of stuff we're showing you. Um, the tradecraft isn't you know top notch. There's more involved, like um, utilizing like invoke cradle crafter, like invoke obfuscation to obfuscate your PowerShell one liner, like st stuff like that. Like not just running you know your U UPX against or whatever. Um, but this will give you a good baseline if you're new into getting a red team or uh, if you're a blue teamer trying to understand what red teamers are doing. I think this will help out a lot. And uh, what tools are being used today? All right. So <laughs> setting the stage. Uh, so we're saying that you already compromised the system. So most likely it was a it was a phishing email or it was a physical access, right? Um, everyone brags and talks about it normally. So uh, they utilize a rubber ducky or a bash bunny. Rubber ducky is seen as a keyboard they plug into the USB that most likely will execute PowerShell one liner or whatever you set it as that will call out to your C2, which is a command control that you would then uh, connect to from your attack platform. And uh, then you can say whatever you want through the shell that you uh, now have access to. Uh, example would be, uh, I've heard a lot and I've seen is, they speak to a secretary, we'll say the secretary's name is Bob. Bob, uh, I need access to these servers, you're not on the list. How do I get on the list? Sarah, the IT director, has to put you on the list. What's Sarah's last name? You know, Smith, Sarah Smith. Can I get your business card, Bob? Sure. You take the business card, you step out, you take a picture, send it to an operator in a hotel room, uh, you go back in. By that time, he's already sent an email to her as, or to him as Sarah, stating that you get access to the servers because he already has a system that he compromised inside and knows their mail server. And it's really easy to send a spoofed email. So then she gives me access and I just plug a bash bunny in every system I see. Right? And, uh, yeah. So, first things first. You're on the system. Who am I? I thought it was really deep. It's a really deep question. So, um, who am I on the network? Where am I in this network? Uh, how do I, can, can I move my current permissions? How do I get system? So, like, system's gonna be like your highest level permission on the, the box that you're on the machine you're on. Obviously, you wanna get uh, administrator, like domain admin is your, probably your end goal, depending on what you wanna do. And, um, but getting systems, you know, important so you can steal processes on your current machine. Hopefully you have that uh, opportunity. Um, an example that I like to say is uh, utilizing these commands is really important because what if uh, the target machine you're on is not within the scope of the network you're attacking? What if, uh, like, when I, when I was taking OSCP, a lot of times I actually exploited my own box. And uh, I just got excited. I got a shell and I would just start running commands. And then... 20 minutes later I realized that I was running all those tools and attacks on my own uh, Kali VM and a lot of people aren't honest about that and I'm very truthful about when I mess up so that, that happened quite a lot and I learned a lot from it though and that's why these commands are important. All right. So kind of going into what Matt just said, we're going to go into some commands um, that can answer those questions, right? Well, you will see later on in the talk that uh, we do have the outputs and us actually running these on a target system through our C2. So some commands I like to talk on are uh, like uh, netgroup domain admin slash domain. Uh, like he said, system is the highest privilege you can get, but that's on the local system itself. Your end goal is going to be exploiting one of those domain admin systems so you can move to the DC or wherever you want on the network. They have high permissions and on top of that, it can go pretty much anywhere they want. Uh, another one's going to be like net user uh, slash domain, shows you the users on the domain. Uh, it's not as important as domain admins, but still they have the ability to move to whatever computer they want to. Right. Next slide. Okay. This is just uh, another list of commands like ipconfig, like in, in his OCP example, if he would have ran ipconfig within his uh, phone in his box or ifconfig, he would have been able to see the IP address was not his target host. So if he saw that, then he would save the time he ran all those other tools, exploits, and commands. Uh, the next one is going to be, who am I? Um, this would have told him right away also who he was on the network, who he was on the target, and when he got the output back, he would have known that he wasn't who he desired. Okay, like I, like I said before, we're going to show you some, just some of the outputs of the commands. Uh, look in the top right, net group domain admin slash domain. As you see in our network, uh, we're Batman fans, so our domain admin is going to be Joker for our sandbox environment. Uh, net group domain, it's going to show you the domains that are on the, uh, the domain itself. Um, on the left here we have net start. This is just going to show you the Windows services uh, that are ran on start, that are on startup, that are started. And then net local group slash domain is going to show the local groups actually on the domain itself. Uh, top left, this is actually one of my favorite just uh, recon commands, uh, net stack, uh, tac, a, tac a and o. 
A is for uh, TCP and UDP. It's going to show both protocols. N is going to put them in numerical value uh, by port. And then O is going to show you the PID it's running at. So if you know, like, you've been compromised, you've been caught, and you're trying to get off the system, you can see our connection right there is running under uh, PID 3344, I believe. And we can go in and kill that process so they won't see that we have an active connection to the target host. So uh, again, uh, net, net SH firewall show config. Um, you can see if uh, something's like operation in mode, it's disabled. Uh, and you, you can get a lot of uh, more information about your firewall. Your route print, you can see all the pathways, right? Um, you can see your gateway and all that. Task list, it's going to show you all the service information for uh, each process, right? Your process ID and everything. Um, driver query, that's a really important one. Uh, you can actually do a driver query uh, space slash B. And then it's, yeah, it's FO, slash FO, space CSV, and you can carry it out. And um, you can actually get a whole list of all the drivers for, like, future po post-exploitation. You can mess with that data. Um, yeah, so ARP TAC A, so address resolution protocol. You know, TAC A is for all. So it's looking at your ARP cache of systems as previously seen. Um, your set command shows you all your uh, em environmental variables. So the reason, like, if I'm on a target, I just run set right away normally instead of doing a system info because I'm lazy. I don't want to wait for all that data. And uh, I just want to see the domain controller right away. I'm like, what's the DC? Set. Boom. There's a DC. I know that. Um, a schedule task. It's going to show you all schedule tasks. The, the slash B is going to, you know, verbose. It's going to show you more information so you actually know what user that schedule task is running under as. Which, that's important information for future you. Right? Um, yeah. Oh yeah, so disrespect your surroundings. But who who am I? So who am I on the network? So I'm K Batman, right? Echo logon server. That's that's another command I run usually right off the get go. But NL test is going to probably um, work better. So you want to get the the DC, but due to configuration changes on the uh, domain controller or um, just the uh, Active Directory in general can affect that. So you want to do a, it's a NL test uh, DS get domain name. But you, if you just do an NS, NL test help, you can actually see that. And I'll give you the DC right away. All right. That's you. So our first demonstration, um, we've, we've now at this point in the, you know, in the uh, test, we have pretty much who we are, where we are, uh, what we're operating against. So now in order to start the lateral movement, um, we're going to run PowerSploit and a module within that is called PowerUp. This is going to do uh, like invoke all checks on a target system. And this will give us the ability to actually see if there's any method if there's any method for privilege escalation um, right off the bat. Okay, so all of our commands are going to be typed into the bottom left corner. Um, right now we're doing a PowerShell tech import because obviously we want to import our PowerShell script that we're going to end up running against the target machine. <clears throat> PowerSploit is the tool suite. Within there, we want to, you want, what do you want to accomplish? Uh, Privesk is what we want to accomplish at this point. And then what we want to use to accomplish that, we're going to run PowerUp.ps1. So now that that's uploaded, uh, to Cobalt Strike, we're gonna, then going to do PowerShell invoke tack all checks, and what this is going to run, you're going to see it blow by pretty quick. It's going to go through a lit of, list of set checks that it will look for for misconfigurations on the network that it can take advantage of to cause that privilege escalation. What you're going to see blow by here in a second, he, uh, we do scroll back up to it. It's a it's a ability to do a DL hijacking attack. It's a very common attack. Uh, used for privilege escalation. What I like about PowerUp is it gives you the abuse function. So you have your right tack hijack DLL commandlet and the DLL path that you're going to want to take over in order to complete your attack. It gives it everything, gives you it uh, right on the screen. So all you have to do is copy and paste. Um, when you're talking about PowerUp, you have to have Goku because, you know, that's 13 episodes deep of him trying to go Saiyan. But um, uh, PowerUp has a built-in module for DLL hijacking. You saw us use the right tack hijack DLL. Uh, what that does is it creates a, a self-deleting batch file uh, on the target with the command you want to run uh, for privilege escalation. You can, you can alter it and change it. And then it creates, using C++, uh, DLL and replaces the hijackable DLL and then runs it. And once that runs, it calls your batch file that you have. And after it runs, you get your privilege, privilege, privilege escalated beacon back. It will self-delete. So there won't be trace of it unless they're doing active logging of like their DLL 
GLL edits and batch files in the system. Uh, so going going to Wimic, so there's a bunch of ways to do remote code execution. Um, there's great examples online as well, and we're just going to go over a few of them. Uh, so that's uh, Windows uh, Management Instrumentation uh, Console. So it's a way of utilizing WMI to um, to get remote code execution of the payload that you already hit on a target for persistence, or possibly you want to move to that target, right? So um, that's this is obviously an example for Cobalt Strike. We're going to do some Metasploit examples uh, later on as well in other uh, commands. So there's a turtle.exe that I, I put in the system32 uh, directory on a target machine, right? So obviously I wouldn't actually name this turtle in a real um, operation. I would name it something that's already on there, and then I would put 32 at the end of it. I would append 32 or something so it doesn't stand out. And I would time stomp it so they would have the same time as another executable or DL or whatever I put on the target, right? So you see turtle.exe is in there. So currently I'm on the, uh, I'm on the dot 12. And you can see uh, I'm an administrator. Uh, my process is 5796. And uh, I'm going to run a, uh, a remote dir. So I'm actually during it remotely to make sure my executable is there before I just kick off a limit command against the target. Because I don't want unnecessary traffic. Even though remotely during does add more traffic, obviously. But I don't want to try to call something with Wimic when it's not actually there. So I, remote, I remotely dir it. I scroll up. I see it's there. Yay. Boom. There's my turtle.exe. I know it's a uh, executable, it's payload. And I know when I execute it that I will get a shell from that target machine. What is it? So we always start shell commands because it's through uh, command prompt, right? It's Windows native. You can do PowerShell and other stuff as well. But the node, you just classify, or you say your target's IP address. So I'm moving to the dot eight. So um, something to think about here is when I, when I do this, um, it's going to take me a second to realize because I used a uh, SMB um, link, or I, I'm linking it with SMB, and the, re the reason I'm utilizing SMB instead of just 443 or 80, right? So 443 is encrypted, yes. Um, 80 is another way to get the call back, but you can use SMB because it goes over whatever. I, I, spe or I specified a random high port for this, this um, specific one, but SMB is usually over 445, right? Your domain controller speaks over SMB to all the other systems. So, um, because I'm targeting a domain controller to get that callback, you don't want traffic going out 443 or 80 because a good blue team or a good uh, cyber, you know, network security team at a company would see that weird traffic. And you'll, you'll see a beacon uh, call in a minute, or I'm a, I should link to it. So it's a binding. Um, it's an SMB bind, so I actually have to link to the target IP. So there's a link. So now it's actually going through my initial um, beacon to the target. In, uh, so that way all the traffic's not 80 or 443 because a lot of times you'll see uh, a lot of operators as soon as they get access to, a D or as soon as they get access to a DC or get those credentials, they get excited and they just run 443 or 80 because they just, you know, they, they'll kick it off and they want that callback. But you need, you need to use SMB or you can do DNS tunneling as well. It's another way because 53, right? Because everything speaks over 53 and SMB. All right. Sorry. Um, going into an, going into another type of remote code execution. Um, one thing I want to state is all these types of remote code execution lateral movement are either through stuff that's natively on Windows or within Sys internal suite, which is a Windows sign executable. So we're using stuff that's already there on the system machine. We're not just downloading and uploading large amounts of data and payloads uh, to the system itself. So this is going to be a scheduled tasks. Um, as you said, shell we're doing within Cobalt Strike again. So slash create that pretty much explains itself. We're going to be creating a schedule in the target system. system. Uh, task name is going to be matt.exe. You guys are going to see a lot of uh, matt.exe and a lot of stuff named Matt because he's all about himself. Joke. But the task you want to run, <laughs> the task you want to run is going to be uh, matt.exe in this case. Uh, we're going to run it once. There's many, there's many different ones you can uh, decide to do. You can do it on idle, on start, on startup, run it once. You can state a time. Um, and so you can actually use this as a method of persistence if you know that there's not a lot of traffic at a certain time of day, kill it at the end of their work day, and then when they come back in at 7.30, your task kicks off, you get your call back, and you can kind of blend in with the network to a certain degree. Um, so here's going to be an example of us actually running a sketch task on a target system. Again, we're going to go uh, shell sketch task. We're going to run the command I read to you previously. Create task name. In this case, it won't be Matt. It's going to be uh, turtle. Uh, the task run is going to be the turtle.exe we previously utilized uh, in, our in our previous attacks. Um, 
Um, we're gonna, since we're, we're gonna kick it off ourselves, we're just gonna run it once and we're not gonna specify a time. So after we kick it off this one time to start, uh, we're not gonna utilize this anymore, just for the sake of example. Um, and we wanna run it under system, right? So when we get this call back, since we're going from administrator on this target machine, we're gonna run a system, so our beacon should call back as system. Um, next, we are actually kicking off the scheduled task ourselves. Um, so slash run, task name again, turtle. So we know the task is on the compromised system. We're going to the dot it again and sp specifying the task to run. Okay, success, the scheduled task turtle has successfully been created. You're not gonna want, uh, not gonna want to run the command to execute it, obviously, before you get that confirmation message that has been created. So again, there you go. Uh, what I like is it gives you the success back. Success, it's gonna attempt to run the scheduled task. Uh, is very friendly with giving you your syntax errors back pretty quickly and not letting you run faulty commands or uh, commands with wrong syntax against a target system. Okay, and once you, we are doing, so we have a couple of our videos, we're running SMB links still because we're uh, exploiting the domain controller. So a little bit of uh, times we pause and wait to link it. So as you see, we link it. Now we have system on the joker, the dot eight, and we're going through our dot 12. So the DC isn't gonna be seeing our Kali attack box on the backside. It will just be seeing traffic from, oh, a uh, host on our networks communicating to the domain controller via port 445 or the random hive port we specified. The final thing we're gonna do, obviously, because we don't want it there, we didn't use it for persistence in this case, we're gonna delete it, slash F is force. Delete is what we wanna do. And we're gonna delete the task uh, that we created and on the target we created. If you, delete the ta if you delete the task itself, it's not gonna kill your beacon. So you will have uh, opportunities to interact with your beacon as long as uh, you want that day, but the next day you will have to create a new task or move a payload over. Uh, the last uh, form of remote code execution I'm going into right now is a service create, another thing that's uh, used natively on Windows. Um, so the command here with a service create, we're going to obviously want to know our target. Create, here we go with Madigan. And then uh, we have our bin path, stands for binary path, and this is just path to you know your executable on the target machine. And then for this, uh, once you create the service, uh, we're gonna kick it off ourselves and then make sure we delete it again, you know, for tradecraft so you're not just leaving started services and uh, leaving scheduled tasks running because those are easy to query for a blue teamer on the other side. Okay. So right now we're interacting with the dot 12 again. Um, we're gonna be targeting the dot eight in uh, this example. Uh, just because it's our domain controller, we wanna show that it works from host to domain controller. Um, and the payload will run on different uh, boxes. So right now we're gonna service create, our, there's our target, the dot eight again, that's gonna be the domain controller, Joker. Uh, this time <laughs> he named it I Love Baby Turtles. Um, and bin path is gonna be obviously the path to the executable we had on the target already. <clears throat> um, this time we put the payload in Windows temp. A good thing, what I like about uh, Windows temp is that it's created like on logon and when the person logs off or system's rebooted, temp will be wiped so you won't leave your executables on the target for a very long amount of time. It's a kind of way to, even if you do forget to remove it yourself, it will be deleted. So you kind of like a CYA a little bit. Okay. Uh, this one did take a minute to come back, so. It should give us the, uh, service create, like the success message, just letting us know that it's been created on the target box. I, I love even when we're in interacted mode, it still takes a long amount of time to call back to our C2. There we go, our create service success. So we know the service is created on that target. And so now we know that we can move forward on our test and we can actually try to kick off the service itself. So there we go, service create. This is us remotely kicking off our service on the dot eight again. Uh, we wanna start it, obviously start, stop. It's pretty uh, self-explanatory, and I love baby turtles. That's the service we created. So, if you if you put spaces in the I love baby turtles or any any of your service create, you're going to have to actually wrap that in quotes because it won't it won't read it. Uh, we got really impatient here because we didn't wait for the, the success message, so we just kept trying to link to it. And the fourth time was a charm. Uh, it ended up kicking back a system, which is what we wanted to run it under. As you see, Joker. There's our process ID, our callback time and our SMB link to the DC. What I like about Cobalt Strike is everything's very, it's uh, very visual and you get the command line, uh, the command line like uh, access as well because the SMB link on the top left, if it breaks or the callback dies while you're on the target, 
that link in the chain will visually break on your screen. It will be separated. Also, what I like about uh, the SMB links is they, the SMB links only call back when you have traffic and input to give the target host. So it's not constantly going to and from. You're not constantly seeing that uh, activity and that traffic. You're just going to see data being given back to you when you're actually running and trying to exploit the target or uh, exfil data. So just because we had a lot of Cobalt Strike to start, we're going to uh, add some interpreter in there for people who are, co uh, people who are uh, enjoying interpreter or using MSF console. Um, so we're just going to do PS exec. So here we go. We're going to load our actual module itself, Windows SMB PS exec. Um, obviously, when you're doing interpreter, the nice thing they have is show options, so it tells you what's required. Uh, our port, we're doing SM, SMB, which, which works with PS exec. So that's already set for us. So all we have to do is set our R host. Uh, this is, again, what goes into exploiting our own box. We accidentally set the R host to dot .12. So if we would have ran this, we would have ran it against yourself. It looked kind of goofy. So, you know, make sure we had it right. Change it to the dot .8. Um, we had credentials at this point. So we set our SMB user and our SMB password. You don't have to, but if you have it, it won't hurt you to use. Uh, run show options again to make, make sure nothing has been reverted to default and all of your options are set in the exploit itself. And then you can type run or exploit. Either way, uh, it will run for you. As you see at the bottom, uh, obviously you don't want to do port 4444. That's common with interpreter. You're going to want to specify your own port, but for the sake of the demo, we left it uh, by default. Um, you're going to see the interpreter session start up, and then you're going to want to do get uh, UID because you want to see who we are. You want to answer those questions that we asked in the beginning of the talk. Um, a process was created. We go down and run host name because once you're an interpreter, you can go inside a shell. As you see, we're on the, we're on the Microsoft Corporation All Rights Reserve, so we're uh, within a Windows box. We have our host name Joker, which has been the dot eight, and now we know where we are and we have our ability to start interacting as a shell or use other interpreter uh, payloads and modules against the target. Okay. So um, we have to mention uh, WinRM for allow movement or moving within the network, right? So it's uh, Windows Remote Management. So it's on port 595, 5986. 5986 is encrypted. Um, a lot of people will argue, and I know that encrypted traffic can be sent over 5985. I'm aware. And um, it's just it's just another good way to allow it to move. And Windows Server 2008, same thing. It's a WRS now. It's just something to be you know familiar with and know that it's already you know it's on the Windows targets. And I love that meme because it's true. You know, Windows Server Security keep out. Or enter. I'm a sign, not a cop. That's very true. And then, um, so next one's a remote registry. So registry keys, right? There's just a dude running the register. Um, so I put a goat.exe on a remote or a target machine on the desktop, just so you can see it. Obviously, I wouldn't do that on a real operation again, but it's for pictures and stuff. So, um, so a remote registry has to be enabled on the target under uh, your services, right? So if you see that's enabled, then you know you can move as well. Um, so for this one, I use an interpreter, and uh, so I already have a shell, and I'm going to add a registry key to a remote machine, and then uh, I'm going to kick it off so that I get a call back from it. And I end up using the same payload that I originally got had this interpreter session on. That's why I'm going to kill my session before the callback. So um, <laughs> there it is. I added it. So I'm going after the Batman computer. So that's a dot twelve. So um, my attack machine is dot six. I already have a shell from dot ten, and I'm going after dot twelve, which is the Batman. So Batman com, um, that's the registry key location, right? I called it Wolf. I'm calling on the goat dot exe, and um, so after it runs, what I'm doing here is I'm I'm shutting down or I'm restarting the system remotely. So I added that registry key to the dot twelve, and now to get that registry key to kick off, I restart the target machine. So it's a shutdown slash m, and then um, I'm calling on that system through the host name, right? And then um, tack RFT, so time zero, do it now, um, force, right? So uh, I, kill, or I restarted the target box. I killed my session because my payload is about to kick off, and I started my listener. So there's my listener. So my callback's calling uh, to the dot six. I'm waiting. I'm then going to show you that the, uh, the target machine, what the user sees uh, when I execute this, right? It takes me a second because I'm slow in videos, apparently. But. It's a lot faster when we rehearse, right? Um, but the, the video is going to come up, the target. So there's my VM, which is the target, go.exe. And then um, you're going to see me capture. The, the shell is going to come in. 
So sorry, it's already restarted. I should have pulled it up earlier. And boom, shell.12, right? It's not have access to that system. And that's what the uh, a user would see if they were like currently on. They would see the box restart, and then we would just have a shell and be able to do whatever we want. And from that point, you know, establish persistence, hide stuff in there, and uh, mo laterally move. You don't stay on the box once you initially compromise it. Yep. All right. Um, DCOM, so DCOM's super technical and in-depth. Uh, so Matt Nelson's the one who documented it. Um, I just want you guys to be aware that it is a way to, to do lateral movement. Um, I don't think I'm by far like the expert to speak on DCOM, but it, it's really important. You know, there's, there's a lot of good uh, res resources out there to perform it. Um, all right. Oh, yeah, this is you. So, uh, so I'm sure uh, everyone here has heard of Mimikatz. It's a thing that's been on AV, been flagged on HBSS and on boxes for a long time now. Um, we're just going to go over a method, how we've uh, experienced and we've ran on tests, where we don't have to put anything involving Mimikatz on the actual target box. Um, we're just going to use a sys internal suite, which is Windows sign, you know, and PS execs in there. Uh, we have, in this case, we're going to be using Procto, right? So uh, once we notice that they have sys internals downloaded on the target host, we're going to use Procto, as you see in the top left hand screenshot, uh, to target LSAS. LSAS is what Mimikatz targets because that is where the passwords are going to be stored. Uh, the the SHA-1 hashes, Intel M hashes, passwords are going to be stored since the last reboot of this machine. So what we're going to do is when we have uh, Procto, we're going to leverage it to target uh, lsas.exe, and the give me you see right beside lsas.exe is the name of our mini dump file. Uh, this is pretty much going to be the output of the process lsas, so we can then pull it down to our target Windows attack platform. And when you're doing this, make sure that your Windows attack platform is the same architecture and same year as the target host you're going after. Um, if not, it will not work. So once we have our once we have our mini dump in the bottom left hand corner and Mimi Cats, we have also you see on our desktop in the bottom left hand corner, we're gonna run mimicats.exe, and then you're gonna see we're gonna take our mini dump file, import it, it's gonna say give me dmp, and then we're gonna run sec urlsa, log on passwords, and it's just against the give me dmp, the mini dump file, and then we're gonna see the output. Um, there was a there's a very long list of users, um, so if you kept scrolling down on the screenshot, we had a limited amount of space. You will see clear text passwords. Here you're going to see the domain, the username, the NTLM, and SHA-1 hash of the target, it's, of the administrator itself. Um, and this is actually really nice because you're not using Mimikatz maliciously at all on the target system. Uh, when me and Matt originally started working together, when he, when I was the experienced one and he was the newbie, um, this is how he first got domain admin yeah. on his first domain controller. So, let's say a quick story because it's pretty cool, and I think it teaches people a lot of stuff. Uh, so I, I ended up getting a default credentials to RDP to a target, which is like super bad tradecraft if you think about it. But um, it was the only way I could get on uh, that system at the time. And then I couldn't uh, use Wemic or get remote code execution on any of the targets I wanted. I saw a file server I really wanted. I knew a domain admin had logged into it. So I thought about it, and I didn't think it would work. And it was really, it was pretty um, ghetto. And it's funny, though. It was, uh, I RDP'd through RDP, and I mapped my share. I moved a Windows Sys internal suite to the target, the file server, um, and then proc dumped uh, the LSAS and created the mini dump file and then pulled everything back. So everything's Windows signed, so nothing malicious. It doesn't look malicious at all to anyone. Uh, um, because this, the, the sysads were using RDP. So unless somebody was on while I was on, then that would have been bad. But uh, I pulled the dump file back, and then and the reason he said the architecture matters is because it actually took me a few hours, which is embarrassing again. Like I admit when it takes me a while, it was, was an x86 target, and I pulled it back at a 64 uh, Cali, and I sat there. I kept running Mimikatz with mini dump, and I realized I had to move to another system or a new attack platform to then uh, get the creds. And then I got <clears throat> domain admin. I'll never forget that. It was the first time. It was really humbling and fun. So, all right. Oh, yeah. Still me. All right. Responder. You can't talk about lateral movement and moving around network without responder, right? Super important, super in-depth. There's a lot of information. Um, so I, I love Responder, it's a lot of fun. Uh, any company you ever go to, if you get access to a switch, if you ever walk in there, uh, depending on you know their port security and everything, uh, they'll never have a lockout when you pull the ethernet out on the first try, normally. Somebody in here will argue with me after, I'm sure. But most most likely network engineers are lazier than that. And they don't want, if something like comes unplugged, not be able to just plug back in and redo everything. So 
Um, a lot of times, a lot of times when I've done pen tests, I'll go up to a switch and then we have port security and I'll just unplug the ethernet from the switch, I'll plug it in my attack machine, right, my laptop, and I'll do a TCP dump or Wireshark and I capture uh, their IP address on their Mac. I clone my Mac, I clone my IP address, I then plug into the switch. Um, they're the ethernet port that I pulled the original one from with my attack machine because I'm now that machine. And then I would uh, run responder, right? And the reason I'm running Responder is to capture hashes that are pass or um, sent across traffic, right? Um, so LMMNR, it's a link local multicast name, res uh, yeah, name resolution and NetBIOS name server is what the other one is, which that's just, uh, they're pretty much the same thing, just um, NetBIOS name server runs on uh, IPv4. So um, here's an example of me capturing a hash from a target user. So what's going to happen here is uh, the target is going to try to access a network resource that isn't actually available. So food, right? I was really hungry, I think, when I was in this video. Uh, so I try to get a food, and it doesn't exist. And because it doesn't exist, it means it's not in the DNS, right? It's going to query, it's going to, hey, DNS, is that there? No. And I'm going to be like, yeah, that's me. It's me or hash. And the computer's going to be like, oh, shit. Oh, oh sorry, language. Uh, oh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's me. And then, uh, dang. And then uh, I get his, so then he'll send me his username and hash, and I can take the hash offline and try to crack it. You can do a lot of things with it. Um, I have an example later, I'm gonna utilize multi-relay. My, my first script I've ever wrote that I was super proud of was automation of um, Byte Bleeder's uh, tool, which was, it was a res or, yeah, responder to uh, crack map exec to NTM relay. And, um, and then a PowerShell one-liner, and I just got shells. Horrible tradecraft, it was super cool. So, there, so there's a user and the hash, right? That's what everybody wants. You pull it offline, you can crack it, you can pass hash, all this stuff. Uh, run finger.py, right, Python. Uh, the, re the reason for this tool is to see if, uh, see what domain and see if uh, SB signing and see the OS version of the target. So when you run that, you're gonna, you're gonna actually see, um, I'm gonna run against the three machines in my lab environment. And you're gonna see on dot eight, SB signing's true. So, you know, responder's not gonna work against that. So I'm sure everyone here for their company, they have um, SB signing on their network, which is a joke because a lot of people have legacy systems and they can't do to Samba and Linux, but so Responder will work. Um, so uh, multi-relay, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing tool for NTM1 v2, right? And um, it'll do HTTP and like nothing like, uh, if you have automatic proxy set in your, if you, if you have your proxy set to automatic for your WPAD on your browsers, right, for your images, then you're open to um, WPAD, which you can actually force WPAD and responder, which just means that um, certain resources that you try to access to the internet, when they query it, I would just say, yeah, that's me, same thing, get the hash. So you don't want automatic set in your, uh, your browsers through your image. You want to go back and set that manually. Um, and here's an example. So this is a dot .12, again, for the, I know you probably can't see that. So it's a dot .12, the Batman target, and um, the user's administrator, and um, actually, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start over. So important, you have to um, turn off SMB and HTTP in the responder.configurationfile.conf, and that's so that you don't have uh, protocol conflicts, right? So you're gonna turn those two off because uh, multi-relay is gonna be utilizing that, right? Not responder, but um, so you're gonna start responder, or I'm gonna set multi-relay first. So in multi-relay, you can do tech. Uh, uh, you, can do, you can do the targets, so you can specify uh, multiple targets or a range, or you can specify one. So say you're going after one machine, then you can specify a user, you can specify all users. So for this example, I'm saying I want this guy, and I'm only going to use this user. Or I'm going to use all users, sorry. This guy, I'm going to use all users. So anybody that passes their hash, any users, I'm just going to relay it to that target to try to get a shell. Which, the shell's the end goal here, right? And, um, hold on. So here's me starting Responder. I think I'm going to try to get a share called Hi Everyone, which doesn't exist. Okay. So it's, it's listening. I know it's listening. I know Multi uh, Relay is currently running as well. And then I'm going to go to Hi Everyone. It's, I don't know. It's horrible. You can't read that. But. So I try to go to Hi Everyone. Boom. Shell. Right. I can dump hashes. I can, you know, get over Meterpreter, Cobalt Strike, whatever I want, whatever C2 I want to do. <coughs> So responder is really useful. <coughs> Next, uh, one of the last things we're going to go into is going to be uh, port forwarding. There's many different types of port forwarding. We mostly go into proxy chains, uh, port forwarding, Sox with Cobalt Strike, and then uh, Metasploit port forwarding. Um, the good thing about port forwarding is it's uh, 
not like, it's not like the SMB links we were having earlier. This is using a compromised host to tunnel traffic through. Yes, uh, you're doing that when you push a payload obviously through SMB link, but this is just uh, for anything you want to run from your Kali box. So in our examples, uh, we're doing uh, scans of a target system from a system within the internal network so we can see what ports are open on it and uh, anything we can target. So the first video is going to be uh, proxy chains with, uh, performing with uh, SOX to Cobalt Strike. The file on the right I'm editing is proxychains.conf. As you see in the bottom, there's our attack box IP, uh, port 8000. And then in Cobalt Strike, we're going to do SOX and then make sure the port links up. So everything on port 8000 is going to be given through Cobalt Strike. It's going to go through our beacon that we have on the dot 12. And then for proof of concept, we go, we're running proxy chains, NMAP, just an NMAP scan. So we're going to be scanning the dot, I believe we're scanning the dot 10, the Batman box, or the, uh, sorry, the dot 10, the Robin box from our dot 12. <coughs> so if you're running packet capture or Wireshark, you know, you're not going to be seeing that NMAP scan coming from our dot 6 or Kali box outside your network. You're going to see it internal if you are in fact running it. So we're looking for ports 22, uh, 445, or 3389. Um, as you see, 445 is open. Um, uh, 3389 with RDP and 22 SH is closed, which is good for a sysadmin, but Eternal Blue can target like SM, can target SMB 445, so we can leverage that using uh, pushing exploits through our port forwarding to target that end, the end host so we can move further into the network. Okay. Uh, port, port forwarding through Meterpreter. Um, at the top, you're going to see us, obviously, we have to create our payload. We're using MSF Venom to create our payload in this one. Um, TechP is the payload we're using Reverse. Uh, TCP, L host, and L host is going to have to match up. Everything in the payload is going to have to match up with everything on our listener. So our Kali box is listening on port 8686. TechF is the format to executable. Uh, cat.exe is the executable itself we're creating. And then we're setting up our multi handler, which is our listener, just to catch that callback once we run it on a remote host. Uh, the next slide, uh, this is important um, because if you, especially if you have insider threat or someone on the internal network, um, we're using Python, a TechM module, simple HTTP server on port 8080 um, to host our, our Etsy TechF directory. That's where we're holding our cat.exe exploit that we want to put on the host box. So say you have someone insider, uh, insider threat or a cat team or someone that goes out, they can browse to our 192.168.1.6 on 8080 and they can see that executable. Depending on the security settings of the target network, they can download that and execute it and give us our callback back. As you see the get request on the left hand side, they are hitting our attack box from the victim. Um, this is just showing you us uh, running our multi-handler. So we're running our listener and we kicked off cat.exe on the target box. Um, we just did proof of concept within shell to show you our host name is Robin. Um, and then we exited out of the shell and straightened back into our interpreter session, which is where you have to run the port forward add. And we, as you saw, based on our MAP scan using SOX proxy earlier, um, we're targeting the 445 on the dot 12 so we can then go exploit that because we saw that port 445 was open. So there's obviously experts on Bloodhound. I'm sure everybody's aware of this and knows what it is, but we can't talk about it without touching it again. Right. So Bloodhound uh, utilizes Neo4j, right? It's a graph database management platform. And um, that's us logging our Neo4j server on the bottom left, server connect, right? And this is Bloodhound bouncing just ahead. It's cute. thought it was funny. No one laughs. It's fine. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> <clears throat> it's important. So you start you start your Neo4j server, and and the coolest part of this, right? So I, I, if you've worked with Bloodhound, you've seen this. So Bloodhound runs, it, it gathers all the user data, and you get the groups and the users. And you know, you know the shortest path to your domain admin or getting to whatever group you want, right? But a lot of people and like so it drops the zip. So it actually drops the zip file to the target, and you, you pull those back, and you upload the CSVs, the Neo4j. You can actually they they actually set it up now where you can um, do a reverse port forward, and um, using a, it's like REST API or like the URI, right? It's like uh, tag URI, you specify your username and password, or tag URI, you specify your pass, so HTTP 127001, 7474, whatever, 76, something like that. Um, you can actually have all the data go directly in your Neo4j from your target, so you don't have to um, drop that zip on a target. And that's, that's pretty fun and pretty cool. So you can just get, you can see your Neo4j just um, updating. You can, and you can do a loop as well, right? Loop, looping is really important because you don't know how much data is going and when the users are active. Um, so that's that's the zip that I dropped on target because the you know, other way. And there, there's an example of what it looks like. So these this is a, the first pass the high value targets, right? Yellow's uh, the groups, green's uh, the users, and then the reds are the box we compromised. 
And it's, it's super pretty. Those guys are brilliant, obviously. Um, and now we're at the end. So like, I have to do references because I don't want to say all this information is mine because it's all out there. And these, these guys are, again, brilliant. And um, I love learning from them and just being around them. So all these websites are super useful. And uh, you should visit them all. Spectre Officer, you know, they're awesome. But, and then uh, people that have influenced us, and they might not even realize it. So I had to put their Twitter handles, or hand, yeah, handles, because I, I follow them super closely. I read all their posts, and um, they're super inspirational to me. They don't realize it probably, so I'm just, you know, I'm just watching them from afar. I'm creeping on them, but it's weird. Um, I met a few of these guys. They're awesome. And, um, and there's Dwight. I love the office again. And like, that's why I imagine a hacker on a network is just like domain admin, you know, network engineer, whatever, like just the same person, just a bunch of different hats. And I thought it was pretty funny. Um, again, Dwight. But uh, if you enjoyed this talk, like to know more, you know, uh, we, that's why I do the reference slide. That's why we, we uh, put the Twitter handle, like hand, <coughs> handles up there. And that's why we're saying message us on Twitter. Uh, I love I love feedback and I love um, getting questions and um, just moving forward with other people and like collaborating. Uh, I love I write in Python. Um, I'm currently working on uh, writing my own implants. Uh, that, and the big thing, so to, to finish up, something I want to mention is a lot of stuff we talked about is Cobalt Strike and Metasploit, but for those, those super awesome red teams out there, they're creating their own C2s and their own implants, and that's how they're not, you know, AV is not going to detect that because they're just crawling all those signatures. As soon as, as, soon as um, Cobalt Strike comes out with a new version, they just, you know, they buy it, or they'll, they'll upgrade their version, and then they just crawl it, and then they update the signatures, and then you're going to get flagged. So. It's great that we're utilizing this, and it sounds really cool, but um, creating your own and keeping it in-house is the way to go long-term. That's going to cost a lot of money up front for development for companies, so just so you know. And, um, yeah, do you mean? That's our talk. We're right at zero. Does anybody have questions, I guess? Yeah. Sorry. Our Windows and Linux, like that's our that's our niche and that's what we go to when it comes to exploitation. But there's people out there that can exploit anything from like the kernels on like the Windows and Kali boxes, or they can uh, do server side exploits, or they can do web web based uh, applications. I'm sure if it's connected to any network on the internet, there's someone out there that has has an exploit for it or can target it in a way. Uh, we just um, are Kali Win and Windows and Windows legacy based when it comes to attackers. Yeah. More. Also, like nothing's really secure, depending on like the value. That's like a huge thing. So, like if if it's super valuable, then yeah, somebody's going after it, and you're not secure. And like, it's it's better to look for already being compromised than to just assume that no one will come after you. Right. right. Yeah. Right. All right. Uh, any more questions? Sorry. No. Cool. Yeah, man. Uh, if you follow us on Twitter, you now I'm saying, uh, but we're, we're going to post them. I wish that I already uploaded them all before. Uh, I should have uploaded them before this. I know, I believe, are you guys going to post the slide? No? Yeah. Okay. Um, so they're going to post slides as well for B Sides RDU. And that's why I made these slides so people can use them. That's the thing. Like, we went to a bunch of talks. People spoke about this stuff. Responder, pass the hash, you know, all this, you know, port forwarding. Like, port forwarding blew my mind the first time I learned it. Like, I was like, I don't understand. So I'm attacking myself, and then it's, <laughs> Hitting things and it's it's working. I, I have a shell that's not me, and um, so no, these shells these shells will be available. We'll, we'll post on Twitter or shell slides, shells. Talking about hacking all day. All right, cool. Is that it? Sorry. All right, have a good one. Nice being on.